let's go ahead and talk about kidneys. Yeah, kidneys are fun. Kidney is king, as the nephrologists like to say. It's not clear why they say that, but they say it a lot. Any idea why? Like, kidney is king, according to kidney doctors. The other interesting thing is how to describe the shape of the kidney. It's, it's basically a kidney bean-shaped structure. That's how I like to describe it. Okay, so let's talk about kidney. So structure, we've covered the structure, kidney bean. We'll go into function. It's probably called king because it does so many different things. It regulates the composition of your blood, regulates the osmolarity, regulates the uh, pH in, in various ways, the electrolyte balance. Um, it moves certain classes of toxins uh, and also plays a major endocrine role, uh, signaling that regulates blood pressure, uh, that regulates uh, balance of uh, phosphates and calcium, and a whole host of other things. So uh, really important, and it's interconnected in a very uh, intricate way with the liver, uh, with the heart, uh, the vasculature, and so it's got a very uh, uh, tightly interconnected homeostatic uh, role as well. So uh, this is what its uh, gross structure looks like. It's got a uh, uh, renal artery coming in, renal vein going out, and it's got a uh, what's called a cortex, which is this uh, rim of tissue uh, where a lot of the uh, filtration takes place. And then it's got an uh, inner part called the medulla, which uh, is where the urine is collected, formed and collected, uh, concentrated and uh, sent out through the ureter, which goes down to the uh, so uh, recap of some of the key functions, electrolyte balance in water, excretion, both metabolic and foreign, blood pressure, and some of this endocrine uh, aspect, which we'll get to in a minute. So let's delve into each of these in, in some uh, depth. Uh, so the first, regulation of water and electrolytes. This is pretty crucial. Uh, if things go awry even a little bit in terms of osmolarity, it can be fatal. If your uh, concentration of dissolved uh, uh, ions, the osmolarity in your blood is a little bit off, that will cause big shifts into or out of the cells of your body. If that happens in your neurons, it can cause seizure. If it happens in your heart, it can cause cardiac arrest, and it can cause global dysfunction in uh, your kidneys. Extremely important. It has to sense and respond to shifts in uh, ion levels. Not only the total number of those, but the identity of each of them, that's very important. Uh, as you remember from your nervous system lectures, the precise concentration of each of these and the relative ratios is extremely important, for example, in setting the resting potential of neurons. It doesn't do everything. Uh, some uh, metal ions are regulated more by the GI system, uh, but pretty dominant role in terms of uh, control. And the uh, you know, it's good to now look at the sort of big picture of where, what, what sort of volume are we talking about? Uh, how many ions? This will uh, be important in making basic calculations about how uh, balance is maintained. Think about that. Uh, total body water, as you probably know, is majority of your body weight, 50 to 80 percent. So 70 kilogram person could be about 42 liters of water. Now, uh, some of it's in the blood, but that's actually a relatively small proportion. A lot of it is sloshing around in between the outside of the cells and the uh, blood vessels. That's called interstitial fluid. And then some of it is actually inside the cells. Actually, a great deal of it is inside the cells. And then a lot of it is sort of uh, in the process of moving, transcellular. Uh, it's in various stages of transport or, or translation. And then even your very dense tissues, your bone and your collagen, they have a strong uh, component of water as well, which actually is important, contributes to their incompressibility. And there's exchange among all these different compartments. You get major clinical problems if, for example, too much accumulates in the interstitial fluid. You get edema, swelling, um, and you see that in heart failure, for example. When you think about how each of these arrows uh, can be regulated or, or become dysfunctional in different uh, tissues. 
states. Someone comes in with you know swelling in the feet, you have to think about which arrows uh, might be responsible for that. Okay, now it's not just a, a static picture within the body. Of course, there's ins and outs, eyes and O's, and uh, there's a lot coming in, a lot going out. Typically, you have about two and a half liters coming in and out at any given day. Uh, a lot of fluid, some in the food, some uh, water is generated metabolically. H2O is a byproduct of a reaction. Those are, those are your gains per day. Then you lose a fair bit of water. Um, some what we call insensible losses, lost in the vapor of your breath uh, uh, through the skin. And a fair bit of, uh, that's, that's pretty dominant. Then there's a fair bit of sweat, which at baseline is low, although it can be very high, of course, in certain conditions. Uh, some through feces and then uh, urine. So this is the main dial that the body has to control uh, the balance. Everything else is a response to environmental or metabolic conditions, and the dial your body uh, adjusts uh, on the uh, output end. Of course, it can control how much you drink on the input end. Those are both. Those are the two things I would say the uh, the brain and the kidney can work together most to control in the most flexible fashion. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's a, a fair summary. The others, of course, are regulatable but are uh, sort of less optional. Okay, so how is this done? Well, you've got, uh, you know, just think about the formation of, of urine. So you've got, uh, you've got your blood, it's got stuff in it. And someone's got a big water load, let's say, they drink a whole bunch of water, they overshoot. If nothing's done, their blood's going to be too dilute. What's that going to do? Well, it's going to force water into cells, it's going to cause them to swell, cause people to die. Okay, that's not good. So what does the kidney have to do? It has to detect this and it's got to get some of that water out. But your blood is packed with extremely valuable stuff, it's packed with cells. It's packed with proteins, okay, uh, the stuff that was metabolically costly to make and generate, uh, you know, uh, minerals that might be scarce and rare, um, amino acids that the body can't make and so are, are crucial to, to retain. So there has to be a filtration step where the good stuff is kept, the bad stuff is lost. And that's actually a beautifully uh, and there's a progression along the kidney uh, its filtration system, and you'll see what these elements are. There's the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, and the collecting tubule. Stuck. And what happens is if you actually plot the concentration or the relative concentration of what's in the excretory pathway in the tubular fluid versus what's in your plasma, i.e. in your blood, the very different uh, properties, dynamics of concentration uh, as you go through the kidney for different uh, elements. The first thing to notice is this, protein, glucose, and amino acids, these are kept, okay? Their concentration plummets to zero in the tubular fluid, what's going to become the urine, uh, uh, very, very early in the process of passing through the kidney. Extremely important, very valuable and to retain, except in disease states. If the kidney is not working well, you can see protein loss in the kidney, foamy urine. That's uh, many kidney diseases cause that. Of course, diabetes, glucose gets too high and you have sugar in the urine. What about all these other things? Well, first thing uh, to realize is it's pretty complicated. There's a, if you look at just sodium and potassium and, and chloride, you can see there's uh, some specific things happening at different stages along the progression through the kidney. And a lot can be tuned uh, depending on how much the body needs of these different ions and water. Uh, these can vary uh, widely. Get into some of the complexity on, on what's happening with all these other. There are uh, some things that are uh, not actively retained but are actively uh, treated. Or, uh, and those include uh, urea and creatinine. These are nitrogenous uh, waste products. That's the kidney's job to, uh, so those tend to achieve higher concentrations as you go through the kidney than what you see in the blood. 
that's kind of the outcome. Uh, how is that actually done? It all starts with the key component of the kidney, this functional primitive, which is called a nephron. Each kidney's got about a million of them, and they look like this. Uh, so you've got your blood supply uh, coming in through the renal artery, and there's something called an afferent uh, arteriole, which forms a little tuft, a little uh, highly uh, branched uh, capillary tuft that creates an immense high surface area at a very focal spot. And all of them do this. Uh, each one of these is, is a nephron. And that little tuft is surrounded by a capsule uh, called Bowman's capsule that is part of the urine collection and excretion system. It ends up being continuous with the urine bladder. It's there to basically uh, receive uh, what gets uh, filtered out. And so the blood comes in here. That's the afferent arterial. And then it leaves here. That's the efferent arterial. And it's going to be venous at, at that point back into the renal vein. So what's going on in here? Well, there's high pressure arterial blood. And you have a very special membrane uh, here designed just for the capillary tuft. It's a endothelial cell membrane that's like no other membrane in the body. It's designed to allow a lot of things to go out, uh, but keep only a subset of things. And it's designed to keep cells so you don't filter out your cells. You keep those. It actually keeps most of the protein, too. It's got a, and we'll show you some graphs on this in a minute, but it retains large proteins and charged proteins. So you don't lose some of these valuable things. But the, the way the kidney works is basically you start by getting everything else out. You dump everything else out except for cells and proteins. Then there's a process of selective reabsorption back of what you want to keep of what was filtered. Take back the ions you need. Take back the water you need. Okay? So dump almost all out and then collect back what you need. And that process, there's this. Uh, a convoluted tubule. There's a long loop called a loop of Henle. And there's a overarching picture here, which is that as you go deep into the kidney, go deep into the inner zone of the medulla, the extracellular tissue fluid becomes very high osmolarity. It's very concentrated as you go deep. And what that means is, this final pathway, this collecting duct, which is going to go into the, uh, the ureters and into the bladder, its final step as it exits the kidney is through an extremely high osmolarity interstitial fluid environment. And it's permeable to water. And so what happens is water leaves. It's drawn up the osmotic. Uh, it's drawn down its uh, electrochemical gradient. In this case, a chemical gradient of osmolarity. And water is retained due to the high osmolarity of the interstitial fluid, and you end up concentrating urine by that means. The length of the loop of Henle and the depth of the medulla that allows the loop of Henle to be so long is extremely important. Desert animals that generate almost no urine uh, have extremely long loops of Henle and they have very highly concentrated uh, inner regions of the medulla. So that's the. Uh, a big picture, and now we're going to zoom in uh, greater detail and think about how these actually work. So here's a single nephron at higher detail. Uh, you can see the afferent arterial, efferent arterial, marulus, structures called, and the Bowman's capsule, which, and you've got the proximal convoluted tubule, which comes right off Bowman's capsule. You've got your loop of Henle. You've got your distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct, which goes out to the ureter. Okay, on all this, now we add in all the other nephrons, and you can see all the loops of Henle, different uh, depths, but all extending down into the, into the depth of the medulla. Um, there are Several processes that are going on that end up creating urine. There's a filtration, there's a secretion, and the reabsorption. We'll talk about each of those in the sequence. Okay, filtration. 
what are the quantitative parameters that underlie the efficiency of filtration and what can go wrong with that? Well, first thing to think about is how much volume is coming through. Um, and this relates to total cardiac output, total cardiac output. And right away you can see people who have heart failure are going to get into kidney failure, right? If you're not generating a high throughput of volume through your kidneys, if you've got congestive heart failure, you've got a weak floppy heart that's not pumping well, or if you're dehydrated, there's not much fluid to go around, well, much less is going to go through the kidneys. And so there's going to be less excretion of waste uh, and less balance and homeostatic uh, regulation of everything that needs to be. And the kidneys have an enormous fraction of cardiac output given their size. They get about 25% of the total blood flow. So the renal artery is an extremely a highly trafficked uh, corridor. And think about per day, about 180 liters of plasma actually crosses into Bowman's capsule. The vast majority is absorbed back. Only about one to one and a half liters of renal fluid. Get down to about one to uh, one and a half liters. Okay, so how... What, what's exactly going on here in terms of regulating what goes through? Well, some substances, uh, like for example, a lot of drugs, uh, more or less uh, passively move directly across. It's a very porous boundary. It's, uh, there's not a lot of uh, active regulation. In fact, this is the main route by which uh, drugs like penicillin are excreted. And if you have kidney failure, that's something you have to think about. Uh, you'll end up requiring a different dose of penicillin because it's not going to be Now, then you've got this active reabsorption, and this is very metabolically costly. So you dump everything out, you take back what you need, and even though that there's only 0.5% of body mass that's uh, uh, kidney, uh, about 7% of your whole body oxygen uh, use is, is involved, and that's because of these ion pumps that are constantly moving to absorb back uh, what you need. So here are some useful numbers that help uh, sense of it all. The first things you notice is how you know, important sodium chloride and bicarbonate are and also glucose. They, in the end, they get essentially completely uh, reabsorbed. You don't lose those at all unless you've got a severe uh, uh, overload or a toxic situation. Yeah. That's a good question, actually. Do the nephrons physically, does their structure change? Uh, or maybe even on a microscopic level, microscopic level, the ion pumps and concentrations? Actually, I don't know that. Uh, it's plausible, but uh, I'm not aware of actual kidney plasticity in that sense. Does anybody know about anything like that? I haven't heard of that. I think it's more, it, the system is set up to work with changes so uh, intrinsically to its structure. There's huge change in the water intake that happens to any animal or any person, athlete or not, but I think there's not a, a deep need for that sort of uh, plasticity. Yeah. Kidney will will lose it if there's too much of it. So that, that's fortunate for us, uh, otherwise you run into problems. But what it does is it tells us, uh, you know, historically, uh, you know, salt is, is, it was a rare thing. It's plentiful, of course, in our, in our world, but it's, uh, we're set up to retain it because it comes and bursts and you don't know when you're going to get your next one. Okay. Um, but of course, you know, there's, it is, although there's not structural plasticity, that it's constantly changing what it's doing to adapt to your I's and O's. And urine composition is extremely variable as a result. So, uh, you know, if you do have a big salt load, you will lose some, some sodium. The osmolarity changes greatly, uh, depending on what uh, does. pH varies widely, and but only in really serious disease states do you get. Uh, a really good question. Uh, it's a, it has a huge behavioral role, as you, as you say, in many mammals. Um, 
and there's some anatomical uh, adaptations to that role. So, you know, there, there's all kinds of behavioral and anatomical adaptations to allow, you know, urine to be shot higher up on trees and so on to give the larger animals. But uh, in terms of a, a special, you know, marking uh, reservoir or volume, which would be an interesting and useful thing, I'm actually not aware. Many organisms do have uh, various uh, uh, glands that secrete relevant uh, uh, pheromone or scent markings that are mixed in with the I'm not aware of a, a, a real st structural reservoir that's the marking. Back to sort of an overview, um, there's a lot of complexity to what goes on at different stages. The collecting duct uh, is where things really get concentrated at the end. That's where, as you go down into the loop of Henle, very concentrated um, uh, depth of the uh, medulla right before you are at the pelvis and the, and the ureter. That's where things get really concentrated and, and water comes out. Now, uh, that is set up, that whole concentration gradient is set up by complexity in the loop of Henle. And you have very complex shifts in ion balance and water balance that happen. Uh, Different permeabilities and different ion uh, pumps are present at different stages that help set up that. Uh, but I think the key thing to realize is it gets concentrated in the end, uh, final deliverable, the final concentrated urine uh, in the Okay. In terms of the different roles that the, these different components play, uh, Delving into that in more detail, the glomerulus, that's where everything, almost everything gets uh, filtered out initially. Formation of what's called the primary urine. Then you've got the proximal tubules, loop of Henle, distal tubules, and the collecting duct. The proximal tubules have got different components and they reabsorb uh, about two thirds of the filtrate, glucose and amino acids, some secretion of uh, organic like urea, potassium. Loop of Henle sets up the concentration mechanism, reabsorbs some of the filtrate. Distal tubules do some reabsorption, and then collecting ducts end up playing a dominant role in, in regulation of sodium and water. So let's talk about the primary urine, and now we're going to get into really close detail on what happens uh, right in this. This is a, a structure that is. Um, engaged in the balance. There's a tension between the hydrostatic pressure and uh, gradients that are uh, due to uh, osmotic. Uh, um, you've got hydrostatic versus osmotic. And that balance sets what's going on in uh, the amount of urine, primary urine that's generated. Okay, and close up, what it looks like is, is this. You've got your lumen or interior of the glomerular capillary. Uh, this is the inside of the blood vessel. And the first thing you notice, there are major holes in the wall, okay? And these are fenestrations or windows. There actually are physical holes which appear nowhere else in the body. Uh, and then there's the basal lamina. That's basically your extracellular uh, proteoglycans and so on. And then there's another series of holes that let you into Bowman's space, which is collected. Photocytes are the kidney cells that uh, help uh, uh, form the uh, structure of the uh, collecting system. So huge holes, those are there. How big are they? Well, they're just right to keep cells in. And although uh, on the face of it, you wouldn't expect them to keep all proteins in, and they don't. Some proteins can be lost, but they also generate not only a size barrier, but an electrostatic barrier. And, and most proteins are negatively charged, and this is uh, set up likely due to uh, the ion composition of the sort of vestibule of these pores is set up to retain negatively charged uh, elements. It's a great question. They don't have the sort of regular uh, spacing that like a node of Ranvier has. I don't think uh, there's a, a logic to how far they need to be from each other. Um, but every picture I've seen shows them in a semi-random pattern. 
the main reason they're there is, is, is just size and a charge barrier. And those two interact as shown here. And you can test this uh, quantitatively. You can provide uh, different sized molecules, so dextrans, which are basically uh, sugar polymers uh, of different radii. And so this is an angstrom, so we've got 20, 30, 40 angstroms. And if you have a neutral dextran, you can see uh, small ones get through or are freely filtered, no problem. They go right through these holes. As you get to radius, you know, about 30 dextrans, it's about 30 angstroms, it's about half uh, uh, retained. And as you get to large, above 40 angstroms radius, then it's about half. But that's neutral. If you're negatively charged, like most proteins are, it's actually even shifted to the left and you retain more, so if you, you actually uh, halfway points around uh, the corner. That's the charge plus the size uh, retention. What does that translate into in terms of molecular weight? Well, what it basically means is that if you have a molecular weight of above about five kilodaltons, then you're pretty well retained. And so these are uh, most of the important costly proteins, albumin and so on, that the body uh, a lot of uh, metabolic cost to, to generate them. Okay, so that's yeah, that's what's kept things uh, above about five thousand. Okay, so then right away you've got uh, a quantity which is extremely important medically, which is uh, the glomerular glomerular filtration rate. In particular, you can think about it in terms of the single nephron glomerular filtration rate. SN GFR. And it's set by basically what I mentioned earlier. It's the balance between the hydraulic pressure pushing fluid and the composition of fluid out, and then oncotic pressure, which tends to act to bring it back in. And you can understand why that's the case if you can push out a lot of water, but you're keeping all this, uh, these proteins which have uh, high oncotic pressure and all these cells. Uh, you know, eventually there's going to be a driving force for water to come back in. And so you've got this tension between hydraulic pressure and water. And then there's a, just a scaling factor, which of course could be set, importantly, by various things. If you have damage to your kidneys, big fenestrations, big openings, well that's certainly going to affect your filtration pressure. You've got these different parameters and it's a pretty useful, simple way of, of uh, thinking about this also varies though depending whether you're at the early or the late stage of the arterial. And you can understand why that's the case too. The hydrostatic pressure might not be that different. It's an arterial at the beginning and end. It might drop a little, but you're going to have a big change as it's progressing through that tuft and then getting to come out the other end. Well, that's when all the fluid is coming out and so you're going to have a higher toward the end, higher oncotic pressure differential toward the end. So that's exactly what happens at the start of the arterial, the afferent arterial. You've got a net filtration, the pressure's winning over the oncotic pressure, but by the end of the arterial, by the end of that tuft as you're getting ready to leave and the parent arterial, they're pretty well balanced at the end and so there's not much filtration going on. And you can think about that. Uh, quantitatively, the pressure, hydraulic pressure breaks down into the pressure differential between the, in the glomerular capillary and Bowman's capsule, usually about 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and then as you get to the end, the oncotic pressure breaks down into the same thing, glomerular ultrafiltrate oncotic pressure, um, and uh, mostly uh, uh, water, so it's a static. And here's what I was talking about earlier. It's the difference between the afferent and the efferent. By the time you get to the end, things are pretty well balanced and there's not much net filtration. Things are set up that way. Uh, at, least. But at the beginning, there is a net force driving uh, the contents of the glomerular capillary. Now, as I mentioned, the, that hydrostatic pressure more or less remains constant. The big change is in the pressure resistance along the capillary. Um, one way to, to, to graphically represent this and to think about it is what's shown here. Um, 
And what's plotted here is the oncotic or osmotic pressure of the glomerular colloid, what's actually uh, present out in the uh, filtrate. And what you actually see as you go along the glomerular capillary, you actually end up, uh, if you have a normal process, you look like this. If you have decreased filtration, the curve is shifted down. If you have increased filtration, the curve is shifted down. All right, so let's talk about where things go wrong and what can be done. So kidneys, you know, they're super important. They're hanging there. They're protected by the ribs. Uh, there's two of them. You can lose one and you're still pretty much okay. Uh, that would be a traumatic issue or a congenital issue. But then there are global things that happen where both kidneys go down. And you start to run into problems when your glomerular filtration rate drops below about half of normal. And what that is called is uremia. And basically, it's, it's everything. I mean, if, if your kidneys are failing, everything is failing. And so the symptoms of uremia, they are very broad and diffuse, but, but often fatal. So you'll have, uh, you can think about each of these and what the underlying organ system that's failing uh, uh, might be. You've got fatigue, you've got nausea and vomiting, you've got uh, anorexia, not eating well, malnutrition, weight loss, uh, breathlessness, or difficulty breathing, or, or sense of uh, not getting enough sleep. Pain, you can get arthralgia, joint pain, or bone pain. Uh, you can get uh, pericarditis, inflammation of the lining of the heart, uh, long term. Particularly in uh, uh, kids, you get growth retardation, uh, and it can be fatal. One of you probably know this uh, sitcom, but this was a guy who was a, a, a pretty famous child actor, but he was extremely short. He had a, a, a kidney problem, and so he had a growth uh, retardation due to uh, chronic uremia early on, uh, different strokes. Anybody ever heard of that? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> no offense? Okay, thank you. All right, so what do you do? Someone's got uremia, everything is failing, you've got Osmotic pressure, you've got pH imbalance, you've got buildup of nitrogenous waste products, uh, urea, creatinine, and so on. So, what well, you could do dialysis. And this, you know, amazingly, uh, a very simple thing, um, but it works pretty well. It's time consuming. Uh, the way people most know about it and the way it's built. And you basically have someone who's in chronic kidney failure come in a few hours. Depending on how bad their kidney failure is, they'll come in more, even multiple times a week. They'll basically just sit in a recliner. And their blood will be taken out, flow through a dialyzer. And there's a dialysis membrane in there where there's uh, ion balance of the correct type. Uh, that's compatible with ongoing life. Uh, and then the blood is sent uh, past that dialysis membrane. And uh, as it passes through the machine, there's a dialysis adjustment of water and ions running down their uh, concentration of gradients. And uh, loss of some of the waste products, uh, creatinine and, and uh, while, of course, the membrane is set up to retain, much like the Earlier uh, fenestrations, it's set up to retain cells and, and proteins. And then the filtered blood is sent right back into the body. Okay. So it's, it's not very efficient. You have to sit there for a long time, but it gets the job done and keeps people alive. And people can stay on hemodialysis for many years. Uh, there are slightly more convenient versions of this. Uh, there's something uh, called peritoneal dialysis. Or you can actually, people can be, uh, can go on while someone's walking around. And basically what you do is you capitalize on the uh, peritoneal lining, which is this high surface area, fairly well vascularized uh, abdominal uh, vasculature and, and interstitial fluid. And you can basically introduce into someone's peritoneum straight into their, their, their belly. Uh, a large quantity of dialysis fluid, and the 
peritoneum will act as your own dialysis membrane and you can walk around and dialysis will happen and then you'll take it out uh, after uh, some uh, days even and you just basically advantage of this is you don't have to be sitting in a chair while all this is going on. And that's uh, works, uh, it's not quite as good for uh, severe cases. So, um, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, in hemodialysis, you have to go to the hospital to get this done. You know, there's, there's the whole the transport and travel issues. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, we do know that it works well. There's a lot of experience with it. You can survive for a long time with it. Uh, this is a big issue, though, access. So it's not as simple as just putting in, you know, a, a port and taking out the blood. It's actually a little complicated. You want things to move efficiently, so you want a high pressure outflow coming into your dialysis machine, but you don't want to take the blood supply of some, you know, part of the body. You don't want to put that at risk, and so you've got this tension. You want an artery type pressure, but you don't want to steal the blood from something. And so what what is usually done is a, uh, called a fistula is created, which is a uh, unnatural connection directly between an artery and a vein. Normally, of course, you go through capillaries and then you come back to the vein. A fistula, this can happen spontaneously. It can be a you know, malformation. Uh, that's how a lot of people end up with uh, hemorrhages in the brain, for example, or spontaneous EVP. But uh, this is a surgically created fistula in this case. You actually directly root uh, part of an artery into a vein. And so then you take this high pressure uh, venous uh, outflow, and that's how you create your interface. Um, so, you, so that's the theory. It works pretty well. You, you can't do it right away. First you have the surgery, then you have to wait for a while. Due to the higher flow and pressure, actually the venous uh, wall adapts and it becomes a little tougher and that's the, the maturation process of the thing. Um, there are uh, synthetic approaches. Um, here a venous graft. And, for various reasons, some people a fistula is not practical, small veins or other reasons. And you can end up actually uh, building the interface between the artery and vein with a synthetic tube or graft. And so the advantage of that is you don't have to wait for the vein to build its uh, stronger wall. You can use it in its placement. And what you're accessing is right through this uh, synthetic tube and so you can repeat the same thing. There is some risk, increased risk of clotting and infection. It's an artificial thing. It's the body's not well set up to deal with it, and so you can have uh, clots. You can also um, have uh, a catheter-based system. This uh, venous catheter, for example, you basically thread in something directly into the uh, vasculature, and there's uh, two chambers, catheter for two-way flow of uh, blood. Uh, you, this you can do right away, so no need for surgery, no fistula, no graft. Uh, uh, it's, you can do very quick, temporary uh, hemodialysis by this. Uh, Want to stick with it for various reasons? You can uh, keep the catheter more or less tunneled or fixed in place, uh, but you, it's, it's pretty good for a short-term uh, emergency. Like with any artificial element that's introduced, you have a risk of clotting uh, and infection. So the dialysis fluid, this is what it looks like. You basically have uh, healthy concentrations of sodium, potassium, calcium, and bicarb, and uh, zero waste products, so they run down their concentration gradients, of course. Um, and, you know, the basic system is, is pretty simple. There's feedback control uh, uh, to detect pressure changes, so a little bit of heparin, which is an anti-clotting factor to keep the blood from clotting while it's going through the vessel. The actual membrane, you know, it's a, it's like a cellulose membrane. Those of you who have done lab work and done dialysis, you know, it's pretty simple. It's like, um, uh, it achieves the molecular weight uh, cutoff that the uh, tubing is. Pretty simple dialysis. Uh, peritoneal dialysis, this is where you introduce the fluid directly into the peritoneum. The principle of the body is its own dialysis machine in this case. Peritoneal lining is the dialysis machine. 
Okay, so mnemonics or mnemonic, I guess, in this case, this is a ways to think about the uh, indications for dialysis. Uh, if things get really bad, uh, A E I O U uh, gets uh, acidotic, acidosis. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities, particularly hyperkalemia, too high potassium, that's extremely dangerous. Um, why is high potassium so dangerous? Don't have any action potential. That's right. Why exactly? Yes, the neurons. Right. So neurons, and actually more acutely, uh, heart. That's probably what will kill you first is your heart instead of the, the neurons. But you, you're, you're exactly right. In any case, anything firing action potential, uh, if it can't repolarize, it's uh, you're in big trouble, and your heart will go into depolarization and depolarization. Hyperkalemia, extremely dangerous. Um, uh, you know, clearing out toxins, um, people who overdose on aspirin or lithium. Or uh, fluid overload, just as dangerous for the reasons we've talked about. Big fluid shifts cause changes in brain uh, volume, and if you have fluid going into brain cells, the brain expands, and even a little bit of expansion can be fatal. There's all kinds of sharp edges in the uh, skull. Uh, you can cut uh, in a fatal fashion your pons and your brain stem just with a little bit of brain expansion. So a little bit of fluid overload and, uh, can be very rapidly fatal. And the patient's not responding to diuretics, things that are pro-urination. Then you can get very serious uremia symptoms, heart inflammation, cephalopathy, which is dysfunction of the brain, uh, cases 